Hello people, um, my name is Joshua Wagman, but I typically go by my middle name Zach just because it's spelled really strange. Um, I'm in the legal process of changing that. But anyway, uh, this is a new video series that I'm going to be doing on my personal philosophy um, in regards to many things uh, including epistemology, metaphysics, and physics. Um, now, uh, for this particular video, I'm wanting to uh, focus on the, uh, the nature of reality and epistemology. Um, which is how we know uh, what's real is real and what's true is true. Now, um, Rene Descartes uh, had once said, I think, therefore I am. And uh, this is the first and last thing that is able to be proven. Anything that you see or hear or feel or touch um, comes through you through the filter of your senses. And your senses lie to you. You see things that aren't there. You hear things that aren't there. Um, you might feel your phone buzzing in your pocket, um, only to pull it out and realize that nothing actually happened. There was no message that was received. Um, but there's another particular problem with um, defining reality by what by the senses, which is that these senses also occur within our inner realities. Um, Take, for example, um, our imagination or our dreams. Um, we see things in our dreams, we hear things, uh, we feel things, um, and our thoughts and emotions are also connected to these things. Um, so, uh, we know that we can't just use those as a basis alone for determining what reality is. Uh, so what is the difference between the outer reality and the inner reality? And the, the answer to that question is nature. Uh, things that happen within the inner reality don't have a nature. Um, they, uh, there's, there's chaos. Uh, things are constantly coming into and out of existence. They're transforming from one thing into another. Um, the things that people say or the actions they take are absurd um, and have absurd consequences. You might uh, be in one room only to instantly find yourself in another. You might uh, end up going down... Um, in like in a nightmare and being chased into a dead end and uh, then when you can't escape the dead end the whole dream just restarts and you're back to where you were um, and it's like as if everything is repeating itself um, and these are all absurdities and um, and but they're not necessarily uh, unreality and, and and I'll get to uh, that in a bit um, but when we're talking about the outer world, which is what we most people would agree as uh, being real, um, we're, we're talking about the things that abide by nature. And by, by nature, we're talking about the, the order or the, the, the pattern to things, the, the persistent patterns. Um, say, for example, you, you have a ball, and you, and you lift the ball up off the ground, and um, you, you hold it in the air, and then you let go of it. 100 times out of 100 in the uh, the outer reality, that ball will fall from your hand to the ground. It, it does it 100 times out of 100. Now, um, there is a particular fallacy that comes from this idea that we can label such patterns as being laws, because you can't prove that the 101th time that you did it, that it's not going to fall up, or that it's not going to uh, turn into a cat, hit to the floor, then burst into flames. Um, there's... You, you can't prove something that hasn't happened. You can only prove the existence of observations uh, anecdotally, and uh, you can prove the existence of patterns. Um, and I, I just want to be clear that, that that's not a statement that's saying that um, it's inevitable uh, through improbability that one time you're going to let go of the ball and it's going to fall off. That's not what I'm saying at all at all. I'm um, just I'm differentiating between what can be proven and what can be observed because uh, descriptions and explanations are completely different and observations and explanations are completely different. Um, now, um, beyond the point of distinguishing between the inner and the outer realities by nature, um, we do have to start invoking some of the senses in order to make sense of reality. We can't just completely cut ourselves off um, from the senses. Um, and when we're, we're talking about the things that uh, exist within the outer reality, which is what I'm going to focus on, um, there, there's two different types of, of things that we, uh, we can concern ourselves with. Uh, the first is the existence of form within space. And when, when I say form within space, I'm, uh, I'm talking very specifically about the, the shape or figure of things, um, like in the artistic sense. Um, Take, for example, the, um, 
most people might, or a lot of people might think that, um, think of things in terms of substance and form. Like there is a substance, like a clay, um, and that clay is molded into a form. Um, but the thing is that you can't prove the existence of a substance. In fact, uh, in mainstream physics, there is this uh, fairly well-known idea that like almost 100% of, the, um, of an atom is empty space. And, and that's just something to, to wrap your mind around. I mean, there's, there's no substance there. There's just, in, there's just form. Um, and maybe, there's, maybe it's not empty space. Maybe there's something in there. But the thing is that you can't prove or disprove otherwise. And it doesn't uh, help us at all to focus too much on that. Um, so the, the thing that we can say that definitively is real, um, if we were to take, depend only upon our senses, is the existence of form. And uh, form exists within, um, by which I mean that it is bounded and separated by the existence of space. Now, space in itself is not a thing. Uh, in fact, anything that exists is uh, bounded and separated by nothingness. Everything is bounded and separated by nothing. And um, on a tangent from that, anything that is nothing is infinite and continuous. Um, and, and what do I mean by that? Um, well, you can't add to nothing. You can't subtract from nothing, and you can't divide nothing. Um, and these are operations that you're taught that correspond to something that's infinite. And uh, there, there is actually a, a very strong relationship between the idea of nothing and infinity. Um, when you divide by nothing, logically, the limit of such an operation goes to infinity. Um, or if you, um, if you divide something um, by uh, an infinite number, the uh, the limit of uh, of this kind of operation is that the the individual pieces end up being nothing. Um, so there is actually a uh, a direct course uh, correlation between uh, nothing and uh, infinite. But um, so this this leads us into the question of what is the discrete thing that exists within time. And uh, I, it took me a while to figure this one out. Um, because what you're, what you're looking at is you're looking at something that exists within time but is not necessarily time, but is also bounded and separated by time. And the, the answer to this uh, question that I initially came up with was this idea of, uh, of consciousness. Um, and uh, I did this through the, um, by thinking of things in the Aristotelian logic of uh, substance and attribute um, using via negativa or neti neti. Um, I am not my hands, I'm not my eyes, I'm not my ears. Um, and if you keep stripping away all of the all of the attributes of the things, what you end up with is something that's entirely being, um, but no form. And uh, I struggled to find a good word to describe what I was talking about because I didn't particularly like the word consciousness because I feel like that's overused and it's not really well explained. Um, and also the the idea of consciousness kind of lends itself to a, a particular assumption about the intelligence of things, whereas this is supposed to be something that is universal. Um, it applies to um, every atom in the universe. It applies to um, things in general. Um, and the, the word that I ended up stumbling upon that I really became fond of was the, the uh, idea of being. And uh, this kind of led into um, rediscovering some old ideas about a dichotomy between uh, being and becoming. Now, what we see in nature, and what I'm talking about when I talk about the discrete existence of, uh, of time, is... Uh, becoming in the in the strictest sense you're you're talking about the the perpetual change or motion or vibration or transition of things from one state to another um, this um, the opposite of becoming is is being and this is something that it means it's complete um, it doesn't change it's it's in its final state um, and there used to be a, a long debate that happened in the past um, about whether or not the true nature of re uh, reality was that things were being or that whether they were becoming. But the answer is yes, um, both. Um, they Yes, they are opposites, but they're also the same. Uh, in the same sense that hot and cold are the same. They're both temperature in essence, but they differ in degrees. And it's also relative. I mean, what's hot to one person is cold to another. And this is the same thing with being and becoming. Yes, they are opposites, but they are also of the same essence. Um, they differ only in degree. Um, 
something can be more becoming or less becoming. It can be more being or less being. Um, whether or not something is being or becoming is relative to the whether or not something else is being or re, uh, becoming. Um, but usually when I talk about these terms, I also kind of generally throw it under the umbrella of being simply because, one, it's a shorter word, and um, two, because being is the, the completed uh, thing rather than the thing that's incomplete, which is what becoming is because it's constantly changing. Um, but there, there's more to it than this as well because um, this isn't just some um, metaphysical um, abstract concept that has no basis in reality. It actually is very uh, real. Um, when we're, we're talking about action at a distance, and I, and I mean instantaneous action, I just mean action at a distance in general, like um, take, for example, gravity. All right? why, would, why would objects that are distant from each other gravitate towards each other? Um, there, there's nothing between them. There, there is an action happening at a distance there. And um, the reason for that is because the being of things is not bounded by forms. Uh, form exists solely in space. Um, and because of that, it is nothing in time. And what it means to be nothing in time is to be infinite and continuous. Um, and this, if you, if you think about this logically, what it means is that we never see forms, um, at least the fundamental ones, come into and out of existence. Um, they just simply are, and we, we, we have a hard time understanding where that comes from. Um, and, but there's an inverse uh, aspect to this as well, which is that being exists solely in time and not in space. So what this means is that being is nothing in space. Uh, and because it is nothing, it is both infinite and continuous in space. And because it is infinite and continuous in space, it is not bounded by form. Um, and in, in addition to this, when, when we're talking about when we're talking about being, I think the word that probably clicks with most people is the idea of a field. Um, like, if you're talking about the energy field of a particle, the, the particle itself is the form, but the uh, field that comes around the far, uh, out of the particle, the energy field, if you talk about an electric field, or uh, a magnetic field, or a gravitational field, or whatever you want to call it, is the being of that thing. And the, the being is, in a sense, the, anima uh, the animating principle of the form. Um, if, you have, if you stripped away the being of the form, all you would have was just a persistent shape. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't move, it doesn't change in any way, um, but if you were to take away the form, all you have is persistent uh, being. Now, um, going back to something that I had said uh, earlier, the, uh, there is a dichotomy between uh, being and becoming. Now, what we call time, we can actually only measure by the existence of becoming. We, we measure it by the way that things change. Um, how something moves or how it changes from one state to another and um, the rate at which it does so with relationship to something else. Um, now, being, being complete, does not change. So where there is more being, there is less becoming, and thus where there is more being, there is less time. And this is kind of uh, analogous to uh, the existence of form and space. If you put a lot of form um, close together, what ends up happening is that there's less space between the form. Um, and this actually, um, this idea leads to the basics of general relativity when you think about it. Um, because what, what is being? Well, if, if we think about it in the, in an abstract sense, it's, uh, it's essentially inertial mass. Um, you're talking about something that doesn't change, um, uh, and that, um, resists change, and... So where there's more being, there's more inertial mass. And uh, in general relativity, what they say is that where there's more inertial mass, um, there's higher gravitational potential, and higher gravitational potential leads to a slower clock rate. Um, this is something that's experimentally verified. Uh, you could take uh, lead weight, um, or something that's really heavy, I should say, um, and stick a clock next to that, and then take another clock that's supposed to run at the same rate, and stick it next to something that's really light. And the two clocks are going to run at different rates. You can measure this. Um, this is also the same principle that they use when they're like um, doing uh, calculations for satellites as well, because the the rate at which time flows um, close to the Earth is different from the rate at which time flows uh, above the atmosphere. But um, there, there's another aspect to this as well, um, which I, well, I shouldn't say necessarily disagrees with special relativity, but it does make some predictions about observations that um, 
would, would kind of make you think a little bit. Um, so we know that where there's more being, there's supposed to be less time. But where inversely, where there's more becoming, there should also be more time. And um, so what you're talking about is that when things are um, have high energies, like when you're talking about um, a higher vibration or a, um, a, uh, a faster motion, like say that they're accelerating, um, they sh the time should actually be increasing. And um, what, what's interesting about this is that special relativity makes the prediction that as objects accelerate, that the inertial mass of those objects is supposed to increase. And, uh, but the problem is that when we do the experiments, we don't observe this. Um, the idea of a neutrino that we see in particle physics uh, is based off of the fact that the energy that we expect is not what we observe. Uh, we can't actually measure the existence of neutrinos. Uh, it's, it's physically impossible. Uh, so they really only exist within the mathematics, and they exist to make the mathematics correct. And to say that the math is the proof of the existence is... is that's a bit of a fallacy. It's a circular reasoning thing, but and there's other things like that as well in particle physics, like quarks. Like you, you can't you can't detect the existence of quarks because um, the unit of the base unit of charge is um, the electron is uh, based on uh, electric discharge by breaking atomic bonds. So there could be no such thing as a fractional charge. Um, and, and even though in mathematics it might work out correctly. Um, it's something that you can't measure. I mean, the the math is the only proof of its existence, and that's that's again, that's just a circular fallacy. But anyway, um, I, as I said, the energy that they're predicting uh, is more than the energy that they're actually observing. And, and the question is why? Well, um, my answer to that question is that as things accelerate, they are more shifting from being into becoming, and in the process, the rate of time is increasing. Well, we know that acceleration is distance over time squared, so if the time is increasing, the energy is actually decreasing, and it probably increases pro directly proportional to the amount of the inertial mass it's increasing. Um, so what this means is that all of these uh, corrections that we keep making in special relativity um, don't actually work. Now, that, that I want to be very specific that I'm talking just about special relativity here, not general relativity. Um, and, and the thing, too, as well, is that this doesn't just apply to uh, particle physics. This also applies to, like, GPS satellites. Um, the general relativity aspect of this uh, does work. Like, we know that that's, that's a proven fact. But there's also, like, there's timing issues that they, they have trouble figuring out, like, where something's off by several picoseconds. And this is uh, mentioned by, um, I think his name is David Holster in uh, naturalphilosophy.org and um, dissident science, uh, that... Uh, the uh, oh, I lost my train of thought there for a second. The um, that the, the timing is off, and it is actually only able to be corrected if you remove that that uh, property of special relativity. And that's not like I said; it's not to say that it's false. Um, it's possible that the inertial mass does increase, but the energy is uh, that's being lost due to the increase in time also would offset it. Um, it's it's kind of like an equal and opposite kind of reaction kind of thing because that uh, it's balance. Everything in nature is is pressure mediation. It's all um, increasing order and disorder, and and that's and that's another interesting thing as well is that um, what we call entropy we try to say is uh, decreasing or sorry increasing disorder. Um, and that's completely false. Um, it's actually increasing order. Um, if you take two candles that are two different temperatures and you stick them next to each other, they will exchange heat until they both reach the same uh, state. The The final state um, within a closed system is uh, that they will everything will be the same temperature. It's entirely uniform. It's maximized order, minimized disorder. Um, but anyway... Uh, The, uh, when we're talking about gravity as well, in, in general relativity, it tries to explain gravity uh, through the existence of space-time curvature. And, and I get the idea. The idea is that everything that um, exists is moving at the speed of light, but um, it, it, the speed, I mean, the, whether it's moving through space or whether it's moving through time, um, depends. Like, if something that's moving in time, uh, might be moving through 
uh, at the speed of light, but it's moving more through time than it is through space, or more through space than it is through time. Um, but the problem is that time and space are two completely different dimensions, and this is kind of reflected in the mathematics. Um, I think it's like uh, ax plus by plus cz minus um, ct or whatever. I, I don't know. I, 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 my, I did the wrong way. It's like I, x i plus y j plus zk minus ct or something like that but the, the c only exists there in order to make a in order to make the units work out it's like a basis um vector but anyway um that that's that's one particular problem is that there's no such thing as a space time those are two completely separate dimensions and um at best you could say that the energy is conserved between the two dimensions which i guess would be fine i would i would be okay with accepting that idea um but the, the idea that you can bend space and time is just something that I, I am not willing to accept. Um, you're talking about things that are nothing. I mean, space and time are not a thing. You can't divide space. You can't divide time. Um, nothing has no attributes. It has no qualities. Um, and, and, and it's all fields. But the, the other idea that they were talking about with, with gravity was this idea that everything is moving in a straight line through space-time and that the curvature of space-time is what causes things to gravitate towards each other, which is a really silly idea because, like, like as I said, you can't bend nothingness. Um, and But when you understand that the rate at which something moves through space is dependent uh, upon its subjective experience through time and that that time is dependent upon its proximity to uh, to being and the amount of being that it's uh, in proximity to, um, you, you get the same result. I mean, it, it's the same mathematics, and the, the only thing that's really different is just, like, the interpretation of that. And uh, I, I think I got into an argument with someone on uh, one metaphysics server um, talking about this because he, he had sworn up and down, like, he no matter how much I would tell him, that the, the for some reason they were going to... Uh, that the math was going to be different. That he had to prove that it was different. Uh, that there was um, that it was true. And I was like, it's the same math. It's it's they're, <laughs> they're the they're, they're the same ideas, just two different perspectives of the same idea. And he he wouldn't get it. And he, we both kind of got angry with each other and frustrated. And I, I regret getting as heated as I did. But anyway, uh, that's uh, I, I think that uh, I'll probably cut it off uh, around this point. Um, and continue on from here in the, in the future. But uh, anyway, um, thanks for watching. And, uh, have a good day.